Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. <clears throat> we are a plant-based fitness nutrition company, bringing you some of the best high-quality and exclusive plants to help you with physical fitness, performance, and overall health. This video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. You know, when I uh, get on some of these boards and stuff and I hear um, people leaving comments of why they think that uh, humans are not meant to eat plants. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, I know that sounds silly, but there are really people out there trying to make arguments that human beings are not made to digest and consume plants. And one of the one of the things that I've heard was, well, but human beings don't produce cellulite. So that's the enzyme required to break down cellulose, which is a major plant fiber. Actually, <laughs> cellulose is the most abundant molecule on the planet. That's because plants are the most abundant life form and they all build cellulose to form around all the cells of the plants. Well, then, you know, you get to thinking like, okay, well then how is it possible that we get any uh, value out of it? Of course, obviously we can chew food and that breaks open the cellulose and releases that. We can blend things, we can cook things and the heat can break open the cellulose and release the contents of the goodies inside. Um, but, you know, the big thing is, uh, the argument is that we, we don't digest cellulose. Okay, that technically is accurate. <laughs> However, human beings have adapted to not to need to produce cellulose. As a matter of fact, um, uh, adaptation in calorie surplus, because human beings have been uh, able to farm and produce our own food, we've been generally in uh, surplus of food. So we actually have epigenetics that adapted to say, wait, well, wait, if you're producing so many calories, you don't need to get extra calories from fiber. Um, so when you look at animals that consume a lot of fiber, like grazing animals, um, they generally have di different digestive tracts than humans. They have different enzyme productions. They produce cellulase or they have fermentation style, um, uh, elementary canals, uh, digestive tracts that allow them to ferment that uh, fiber and cellulose to produce short chain fatty acids. As a matter of fact, gorillas are really good fermenters of, um, of, of fiber. Uh, as a matter of fact, they'll get up to 50% uh, of their total caloric intake from fiber. Remember, short chain fatty acids are fats have a little over two times the amount of calories per gram as protein or carbohydrates. So they're a very efficient source of a lot of calories and twice um, over twice as much calories in a small package in the same package. So fats are actually a very good thing to do. So when you look at a the dietary uh, intake of gorillas, it's mostly greens and grasses. And you say, well, where's the fat in that? There's no fat. No, they get the fats from fiber by converting through fermentation that fiber into short chain fatty acids. Now, in human beings, short chain fatty acids not only can pr produce and, uh, and give us extra energy, which we can use that short chain fatty acid for energy through beta oxidation. That's the burning up of that, utilizing it, breaking it down uh, into usable energy. But we can also use these short chain fatty acids for a whole host of other beneficial products. But let's dive into this. Okay, so the average American consumes about 15 grams. <laughs> it's pathetic, isn't it? 15 grams of fiber a day. That's, that's sad. When you look at caprolites, which is fossilized human poop from early human beings um, going back about 10,000 years. For about 10,000 years, we've gathered up these poop and found that they consumed anywhere from 100 
to 225 grams of fiber per day. That was uh, evident by what was fossilized in the poop, uh, the human poop that they were leaving. So um, yes, they were consuming a lot of plants. If you say that Americans are consuming 15 grams of fiber a day and they were consuming 150 grams to 200 grams of fiber a day, that's 10 times as much plants is what they were consuming. Now, plants take up a lot of a lot of space. You know, if you eat a huge salad, you're going to take up a lot of space in your stomach because it's calorie poor and fiber filling. So fiber can be actually very satiating for us. Um, but what that means is that they were consuming so much of that, there was basically almost no room to put in any animal products. And that shows us that for about 10,000 years, human beings who lived on this planet uh, consumed a predominantly plant-based diet, mostly tubers, uh, roots, like onions and potatoes and, and um, uh, different starchy type vegetables, as well as uh, beans, greens, grains, that sort of thing too, all high in fiber. Okay, so what do we do with that fiber? And let's take a look at what the research is saying. Okay, first, do microbiota, that is our good bacteria in our gut, make carb and fiber digesting enzymes? I'll put the results of this and the copy of this first study on the screen so that uh, you guys can see it in the comments section and you can look up the studies for yourself. I'll always include the links. This will be in the comments section on Clean Machines Facebook page, Clean Machine Fit on Facebook. But I'll put it up on the screen so you can follow along too if you're watching this on YouTube or not getting the uh, comments section there. Okay, so this uh, is carbohydrates and digestion and fermentation from Tufts University. And it said a thousand species known to inhabit the human gut gives us a walloping estimated 60,000 or more carbohydrate degrading enzymes. That's right. So our, our body is adapted to say, hey, wait a minute, our gut is so good at producing these enzymes we don't need to. So while that is true that human beings have adapted to not even producing any cellulase or uh, fiber digesting, cellulose digesting enzymes, we don't need to. Our gut microbiota to do it for us. So that's a really good thing. And that also is an indication of why we need to keep feeding that bacteria in our gut the fiber that they need because they break down that fiber and they use some of it for energy for themselves. And then they release different short chain fatty acids that we get to use. So nice, we feed them, they feed us. That's a great symbiotic relationship of our bacteria, but they require fiber, polyphenols, oligosaccharides, all of these things from plants. Resistant starches is another good source of prebiotics for it. But these all come from plants. So uh, feeding yourself a, a, a meat-based diet might have helped us on rare occasion just get enough calories in to prevent from starving to death. But evolutionarily, our digestive tract is set up to ferment and get fibers. We feed them, they feed us. All right, so there it is. So what do these short chain fatty acids do? Let's go ahead and put this next study up. The uh, study is called The Role of Short Chain Fatty Acids, the Interplay in Between Gut, Gut Microbiota, and Host Energy Metabolism. Now, this part is, is, is pretty important. I'm going to put the whole thing. I don't know if it's going to fit up here on the screen. I may have to copy or just read that. No, nope, it doesn't fit on the screen. Okay, but this is the study. There's the link for you. And uh, I'll go ahead and read it verbatim quote from the study. In the last few decades, it's become apparent that short chain fatty acids might play a key role in the prevention and treatment of metabolic syndrome. This is diabetes, right? Metabolic syndrome, diabetes, or diabesity, which is what we now call it, which is obesity and diabetes combined. So metabolic syndrome, bowel disorders, certain types of cancer. In clinical studies, short chain fatty acid administration positively influenced the treatment 
of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, diarrhea. So all of these are showing this that it improves our gut health, but also can prevent and block even some, inhibit some types of cancers, uh, diabetes, bowel disorders, all of these things, Crohn's disease, also ulcerative colitis, all of these things may be beneficial by these short chain fatty acids that are produced when our bacteria ferment the gut and break it down and produce these for us to use. Not only the short chain fatty acids can be turned into real energy that our bodies can use to feed our energy, but they also can be used to heal and repair our gut lining, prevent cancers, and prevent disease states. So this is why they're so important, these short chain fatty acids. So the next question is, well, wait a minute. I didn't think that uh, cellulose was able to be attached to by these bacteria. Well, it's funny that it took a long time, but just recently a study came out and showed that how bacteria actually uh, <laughs> adhere to fiber in the gut. I don't know why it's taken this long for scientists to figure this out, but at least we have the uh, information now. I'll put this study up on the screen too so that you can see it. And this study is titled just like it sounds, how bacteria adhere to fiber in the gut. Now, what they do is researchers quote, Quote from the study, researchers have revealed a new molecular mechanism by which bacteria adhere to cellulose fibers, real important, not just fiber, but actual cellulose in the human gut. The bacterium under investigation uses an intricate network of scaffold proteins and enzymes on the outer cell wall referred to as the cellulosome network and they attach to and degrade cellulose fibers. Boom, there it is. This is how our bacteria can break down cellulose, the most abundant material that we consume when we are on a plant-based diet. And <laughs> the most important part of the plant-based diet uh, to allow that breakdown of those cellulose fibers so that we get all those amazing nutrients that are locked inside those cells. Okay, so let's take a look at the next study. So how much of that fiber is actually getting digested? Is it just a little bit? Well, when they originally did studies, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into this because this is interesting. Let me go ahead and put the, first, the uh, study on there, which actually uh, went in and found out exactly how much of the fiber and the cellulose is, is being digested. So this study is called uh, Neutral Detergent Fiber, Hemicellulose and Cellulose Digestibility in Human Subjects. So this speaks to it directly. This is how much cellulose, remember this is the big argument against the plant-based diet that we don't digest cellulose. And we actually do with the help of our bacteria. How much of that is being digested? Well, let's put up the results of their study. Put this up on the screen. And I think it's going to surprise you because most of the studies were saying only a little bit of cellulose actually gets digested. When they actually broke it down and looked at it directly, and I'll read it right from the study for you, the digestibility of cellulose and hemicellulose in a group of seven women on standardized diet was estimated between 70 and 72 <coughs> percent. Excuse me. Now, this is pretty exciting because this is way more than the few percent that we assumed that human beings were able to break down in that. But let's go on to read the rest of it. So they they tried an experiment and I'll read it. Uh, quote directly, in a separate experiment, this is the last line of the study that's on the screen right now, the quote from the study that's on the screen right now, in a separate experiment, 16 grams of an isolated uh, uh, fiber called so Solka Flock, it's a brand of a isolated fiber, was ingested with a semi-purified liquid diet, and only 8% of that cellulose was actually digested. 
Now, this is interesting, which may be very important because if you think, oh, I'm going to meat based diet, but I just take uh, Metamucil or something like that as an isolated fiber. Well, that means that fiber could potentially not, not be barely digested at all. 72% when it's in food, 8% when it's in a fiber supplement. So you might get benefits from that fiber being bulk and just passing through the digestive tract, which is okay. There's some benefits to that, but you're not going to get the breakdown and the short chain fatty acid production by using a fiber supplement. Real important here because this study really breaks that out. Um, so, and I'll go ahead and put up the, the secondary quote and the findings, the conclusions of this study. And what they uh, say as conclusions of this, the results suggest that more than half, actually over 70% of the fiber in a, uh, uh, they measured low cellulose diet, which is meaning you only got the cellulose from food intake. <laughs> and the high cellulose diet had the added uh, isolated fiber. Uh, so what they were seeing is the difference between there and that only 8% of the cellulose was digested if it was from a fiber supplement, whereas 70 to 72% was actually digested if it was from real whole plant foods. So big difference um, between what was being digested. And this is part of the reason that when you do scientific research and you say, oh, okay, well, let's look at how uh, human beings digest fiber. Okay, let's grab a commercial fiber product off the shelf and see how much of that plant fiber is digested. Oh, well, only 8% is. So the assumption is tell everybody that fiber doesn't digest. And that's how we get misinformation from science. That's how we get studies that lead us to wrong conclusions because they're not looking at the whole plants being digested in the food. It wasn't until this one showed that 70 to 72 percent, not 8 percent, 70 percent was actually digested um, when it's in its whole food plant state. So this is a huge difference, and this is how science can get things so terribly wrong, make assumptions, get that information out to doctors, put it in textbooks and stuff like this. People read it and then assume that's the truth. I read, my doctor said that only 8% of fiber is digested. Well, yeah, and a supplement, because that's what they used in the study, not the whole plant foods and not doing the research to actually show how much of it is actually converted into short chain fatty acids. So now that we have better research to play, replace this old outdated research, we can see that this assumption that plants are bad, plants aren't meant to be eaten because we're, you know, don't digest the cell, it was just flat out wrong. These were wrong assumptions based on research that was done incorrectly based on not utilizing food intake, which was what naturally would be occurring in people. So <clears throat> this next study is pretty interesting. So the question then is, how much is actually used by us? Yes, our microbiome is breaking down this fiber into poss possibly short chain fatty acids, but how much is actually being used by humans? This is an interesting one. <laughs> okay, first, let me put up the study so that you, if you guys want to read the full study to make sure I'm not cherry picking quotes out of the study. <laughs> um, and I encourage you to do your own research on this. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it, especially somebody watching it on, on uh, as uh, Mike the Vegan says, don't don't listen to some dude quoting studies on, on YouTube, including me. That's why I put these links up there for you. You can go out and read the studies yourself. You can see what they really are saying in the studies. I'm giving you the pertinent aspects so that we can condense this down into something shareable so that we can talk about it. But I want you to see the full, whole full studies out there. Now, what did this uh, study come to find? Okay. Here is what that study, I'm going to put it up verbatim quote as usual. 
I will put it up on the screen and then we'll discuss it. So the study that humans have intestinal bacteria that degrade plant cell walls or cellulose in herbivores. So humans and herbivores, the study is saying, both have this ability. That's because humans are herbivores, <laughs> but we do them in quite a, in a slightly different way than some other herbivores. Like we're not ruminant animals. We don't have multiple stomachs. We don't regurgitate our food, chew it and swallow it again. Those are different ways. We are more like primates, like gorillas who ferment this in our colon. So 90 to 95% of the short chain fatty acids produced in the large intestine by the fermentation of dietary fiber are absorbed in the large intestine. That's 90 to 95% of this fermentation process that is going on by a bacteria producing short chain fatty acids is actually absorbed by us. And remember, 70 to 72% of that cellulose is being broken down by our bacteria. So we're getting a fair amount of good energy and very important short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, boost our immune system. They support the production of things like cathelicidin. Check out my videos on, on cathelicidin and D3 and, and how human beings use butyrate to upregulate cathelicidin, which kills bacteria, viruses, yeasts, and other infectious organisms. That's one of the major defense mechanisms, and it's stimulated by these short chain fatty acids, specifically butyrate. Just type in butyrate immune system, that's B-U-T-Y-R-A-T-E, immune system, and you're gonna see a whole host of amazing studies talking about how important butyrate, which is made from plants, fiber, Fiber only comes from plants. Butyrate only comes from plants. This is where we get it from. So this is how we get it by short chain fatty acid breakdown, breaking down that cellulose, 70% of it, and then 90 to 95% of those short chain fatty acids being used by the human body. This is amazing. Now, some of those short chain fatty acids can be used directly for energy. There are fats, so we can burn those fats for energy. Some of them use it for healing. Some of them actually feed the cells in our gut lining. So if you look at this sentence right on the screen, it says uh, the short chain fatty acids absorbed in colon contribute six to 10% of the total energy requirement of humans. 10% of the energy and that this contribution, this is really important, that this contribution is probably increased in humans who consume more fiber. Okay, so let's get that. So if human, if Americans are consuming 15 grams of fiber and we're still getting 10% of our total body's energy from that fiber, and 15% is way below our RDA, what we're required, which is more like 28 to 35 uh, grams of fiber. So it's not even half of what we should be consuming. And we look at our ancient ancestors, we're consuming 100 to uh, 200 grams of fiber per day. It means they were getting probably the majority, up to 50% or more of their total body's energy from the digestion of fibers and cellulose. Wow. How we have shifted from a majorly plant-based diet, getting our energy from actually breaking down that fiber, boosting our immune system so we can fight off almost any infection, uh, even COVID. COVID is known to be killed by cathelicidin, which is boosted by butyrate, a short chain fatty acid produced from the fermentation of fiber in our guts. Do you see the whole chain of events? We're way under eating plants, 15 grams of fiber. We should be eating closer to 100 grams of fiber. I put my food, my normal food intake, I'm well over 100 grams of fiber every day. Now that is producing extra energy for me, energy for my muscles, energy for healing and repairing, energy for my immune system to stay strong and healthy and protect myself. 
all of this from fiber and cellulose. And for those people out there still think fiber and cellulose is just bulking agent to pass through the digestive tract, oh my God, you're missing out. We're looking at probably 40 to 50% of the energy for gorillas is from their short chain fatty acid digestion of uh, fiber. Here it is, we're missing out on a huge energy source. And the reason our body is turning off through epigenetics, we've got this gene here, and on it there's a gene that says produce an enzyme, cellulose, to break down that and, and make it usable energy. Well, when the body sees a lot of energy, it says, well, you don't need that energy. Let's leave that fiber alone so the bacteria can eat it. You support the, you're supporting the health of the bacteria, great thing. And then in turn, they get the energy they need to survive and populate and grow and digest our food and make it bioavailable for us. Win-win symbiotic relationship. But as we have so much excess calories, like in the standard American diet today, the body turns that gene off because it says, wait a minute, we don't need that extra energy. But if you go to a completely plant-based diet, that gene can be turned on and we actually may be even producing even more energy. But our guts still are doing all this energy production for us, so we don't even need that. So we now know scientists, especially evolutionary scientists are saying that this was the backup energy source for us, for our bodies to be able to make energy out of indigestible fiber via a symbiotic relationship with our microbiome and our gut. Very important for our overall health. So I'm going to um, leave you an and in, in this last study, and the final question is, yeah, but I don't digest fiber well. Well, is it true then if for every human being? And let's see what this study has to say about that. I'm going to put this final study up on the screen. So once again, that you guys can see it, you can check out the study yourself. And this study is the cellulose degrading microbial, microbial community in the human gut varies according to the presence and absence of methanogens. Uh, this is, uh, there are certain people that produce more methane and you can measure that through breath analysis uh, and some people produce less of it. So they were thinking that, okay, some of these methane producing bacteria are the ones that actually uh, cause the uh, uh, production or the breakdown of the cellulose fibers, right? Because it's releasing methane in the process. So they thought, oh, wait a minute, there are certain people that produce a, a higher amount of methane, certain people that don't, maybe they don't have the bacteria to actually break down that cellulose. But this is what they found out. Uh, for the discussion, which is usually follows the conclusion, the discussion, and the, it's right there on the screen for you, you can read along. The present study demonstrates that cellulose degrading organisms are present in the gut microbiota of all individuals, regardless if they have uh, methane conversion, uh, gut bacteria or not, in all individuals. That means every human can break down this cellulose fiber in the gut. It's not, oh, I don't break it down, or I, I have different genetics that don't break it down. No, wrong, false, all humans do it. It's innate. Now, is there an odd exception where somebody has a genetic defect? Well, that's possible, uh, but you can get tested. Are talking the vast majority of people, the average person is breaking down cellulose in their digestion tract by their bacteria, and it's converting them to short chain fatty acids on a 70 to 72% basis. And 95% of those short chain fatty acids are being used for our health. There it is, guys. Let's blow these myths up. You know, the science is out there. Let's stop perpetuating, oh, I can't digest fiber. Yes, yes, we all do. 
And it's not that we, the human being, actually produces the enzyme to do it. We don't need to. We have a beautiful symbiotic relationship with the microbes in our gut that do it for us. They help us digest and get more out of the food. They convert polyphenols into wonderful metabolites, phytonutrients into different metabolites. They do the conversion of fiber into short chain fatty acids. They do a lot of great things for us. They communicate directly to our cells to monitor iron and regulate iron in the gut so not too much iron gets absorbed in the gut. They're doing all kinds of functional cooperative relationships. They do that because they live in us. They depend on our food intake. And in return to say thank you, they help support and keep this organism alive because without us, they all die, 40 trillion of them, they're going to die. So they're trying to support us and our health by producing these wonderful short chain fatty acids, propionates, butyrates that help us survive in caloric load and help us maintain optimal health an optimal healthy gut, prevent diseases, including cancers and uh, bowel diseases and advanced diseases like uh, metabolic diseases like diabetes. Really important, and they all come from plants. All the prebiotics, uh, almost all of the prebiotics come from plants, fibers, cellulose, um, pectins, uh, uh, oligosaccharides like fructo oligosaccharides from fruit, um, uh, polyphenols, which actually feed these microbiome, the good, healthy, good bacteria, all of them there to help support you and give you the best life that you can. Let's blow up these myths. I'll always do that. If you have some specific myths that you've heard, please leave them in the comments. Uh, I'll do my best to bring out the research and see what the research really says. And hey, if there is legitimate arguments on why we shouldn't be eating plants, I'll even post that because I want to give the correct information of what human beings should be putting in their mouths to get the best health because that's what I want for you. It's why I formed my company to bring these extraordinary plants that no one else was bringing to market. I was the first to bring ahi flower to market, the richest source of omega-3 of any plant ever discovered. I was the first to bring lentine to market, the first plant to discovered with bioactive B12 in it, the richest source of uh, plant nutrients of any plant ever discovered one of the highest in essential amino acids of any plant, just some extraordinary plants. Uh, the cactus flower, the only plant I know of that actually is uh, able to uh, optimize our hormones, both estrogen and DHT at the same time to that degree, nothing like this on the market. First to bring that to market. I'm going out there doing the research, looking at the studies, looking at what these benefits can be for human beings and bringing them to you so that you can enjoy the benefits where other brands are just looking for marketing and profits. I'm looking to, to bring the best in nutrition to you. That's why I do what I do and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you enjoy uh, some of these uh, educational things. If you do, please give it a thumbs up, share if you can. It helps get this information out to more people so we can blow up these myths that are holding people back from living their best lives. Thanks everyone, we'll see you next week.